Welcome to High Truths on Drugs and Addiction, where national experts bring you facts and answer your questions. I am your host, Dr. Onit Lev, an emergency and addiction doctor who has served at the White House and still practices on the front lines. Right here on High Truths, you will learn from experts, hear stories from the emergency department, and listen to people who have struggled from addiction. Friends, fentanyl is plaguing America. It has infected all illicit drugs, from cocaine to meth, counterfeit pills, and even marijuana. If you are around someone who may be using drugs, you should carry naloxone, the opioid reversal agent. Carrying naloxone for drugs is like carrying an EpiPen for allergies. If you need a prescription for naloxone, you should have one, no questions asked. That is why I am offering a free prescription to anyone who needs one. Come visit me on hightruths.com to learn more about the show, submit a question, or download a free prescription for naloxone. And if you like the show, do me a favor. Give us a five-star review and subscribe. Your stars are very much appreciated and go a long way in supporting the program. Today's episode is sponsored by Isaac, the International Academy on the Science and Impact of Cannabis. Visit their website, isaacone.org, I-A-S-I-C-1.org, to follow the science on marijuana. Hello again, High Truth listeners. I love driving with you in a quest to engage in informative and impactful conversations. I'm your host, Dr. Onit Lev. We are driving conversations and also talking about driving on the roads. Can you guess when and where the very first drunk driving arrest was made? Let's start with some history. Alcohol and getting drunk starting in the biblical era. Noah of Noah's Ark had a drinking problem. Just a few centuries later, cars were invented in 1886 by Carl Benz. Cars became available to the masses in 1908 with the Model T by Ford Motor Company. In 1897, between the time of invention of the automobile and its ubiquitous use, a taxi driver in London named George Smith crashed his cabbie into a building while intoxicated. George was arrested, pled guilty, and paid 25 shillings for his crime. Drunk driving remains a serious problem and now is addressed along with drug driving. In 1995, my husband and two sons, four and two years old, were driving a van on the way to a vacation at the Grand Canyon, and we were hit from behind by a Camaro at freeway speed. Our car rolled over on its roof and spun 180 degrees, dumping my two boys in the middle of Interstate 15. My husband and I were suspended upside down in our seatbelt. At the time, I was a flight physician for Life Flight, a rescue helicopter, and went into work mode. I helped with CPR of the driver of the Camaro through a broken windshield. The driver unfortunately died, and his autopsy showed alcohol and cocaine in his system. Thankfully, my entire family was spared, and we commemorate the day as a miracle every year. NHTSA, the National Highway Traffic and Safety Administration, reports 10,142 deaths from drunk driving crashes in 2019. That's one person every 52 minutes. They share data from 2020 that 56% of all fatal crashes and serious injuries tested positive for at least one drug. Alcohol was the number one drug, and cannabinoids was a very close number two. If you are interested in prior podcasts that addresses drug driving, I refer you to episode 59 with Jennifer Cefaldi, an attorney, episode 30 with Dr. Phil Drum, a pharmacist, and episode 10 with Ed Wood, head of Driving Under the Influence of Drugs, Victim Voices. And with that, let's hear our question of the day. Hi, my name is Puolani Vasquez, and I am the Trauma Injury Prevention Coordinator for a busy Level 1 Trauma Center, and I work with the community on educating prevention for the tragic injuries we see in our hospital. Thank you, Dr. Lev, for your community work and all of the educational insights you provide throughout this podcast. 
You know, one of the problems we encounter is drug driving. We have patients clearly impaired from using marijuana, and yet these terrible injuries are not looked at through the same lens as the prevention targeted at drunk driving. In fact, remarkably, I still hear people saying that they drive better after they've used marijuana. How can we do better or what can we do differently in our prevention efforts? Thank you, Pua, for taking frontline experience from a trauma center and translating that into prevention. What an impactful and important mission. To answer your question, I have the founder of MAD, Mothers Against Drug Driving, Candace Leitner. Candace Leitner is one of the most influential American citizens of the 20th century, according to People magazine, who call her the conscious of a nation. She's the founder of Mothers Against Drunk Driving, MAD, and We Save Lives. She founded MAD after her 13-year-old daughter, Carrie, was killed by a drunk driver who was a multiple repeat offender. She's credited for saving more than 400,000 lives. She's subject of an Emmy-nominated TV movie entitled Mothers Against Drunk Drivers, The Candy Leitner Story. You can find more information on Candace Leitner on the High Truth show notes. Candace Leitner, welcome to High Truths. Hi, thank you for having me. It is very exciting to have you join this program. And I recall fondly when we met at a Sam Smart Approaches mm-hmm. on Marijuana event. And I like saw you and I said, okay, I have to, I have, to have a conversation with this legend. Oh, thank you. Um, and uh, so you are the mother, the mother of Mothers Against Drug Driving mm-hmm. and the mother of many movements. Uh, you started MAD as a grassroots movement in California and now it has 400 chapters around the world. Tell well, us about... Actually, actually it doesn't. Um, I did start MAD as a grassroots organization and when I left, it had more than 400 hundred chapters around the world. However, since then, uh, MAD has changed their infrastructure. So they no longer have grassroots advocacy and they no longer have chapters. They actually have paid staff around. That's the what happens when you leave, Candace. <laughs> That's the truth, and what a shame. Yeah. But tell us about the early years of your activism and, 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 and maybe just start with the tragedy um, of, of losing a child. And, and tell us why losing is not a good word. I just said it. You know, and, and I understand that. You, I, I have said it too since I've said I don't like it in the yeah. past. And then I still find myself, it's because it's so common. I actually wrote a book on grieving, how to cope with grief and get on with your life. And we talk about that word in the book too. And why we, especially those of us whose children have been killed in a crime by somebody who made a choice. Um, that ended up killing our children, why we have such a hard time with that, because it's not accurate. Um, She, my 13 year old daughter, Carrie was killed by a multiple repeat offender drunk driver who was actually out on bail from another hit and run drunk driving crash had had four of the prior drunk driving arrests, I think before that. And in California, this happened in California, he was still driving on a valid California driver's license. And can you believe that? Yeah, I can. So um, when she was killed, when I learned, it was a hit and run. So it was several days before I learned actually what had happened and, and who had killed her. I also learned at the same time that because of the inadequacy of the laws, public attitude, the lack of enforcement, that he probably wouldn't even go to jail, much less prison, because I obviously, as a mother, thought this man um, who had committed so many of these crimes would go to prison. And they told me, no, probably not, not even jail. So I started mad three days after she was killed. She was killed May 3rd, four days. He was arrested May 7th, and I started mad on May 7th. Did did you play on the words mad because you were mad, angry? Mm -hmm. No, I had nothing to do with the name. I give my girlfriend credit for that. We were sitting actually in a bar at the restaurant waiting to go into dinner. And um, there was a group of us that had all come for the funeral. And when we were on our way there is when I saw the yellow tape. The CHP were doing the yellow tape around the scene of the crash. And so, and I had stopped and talked to them. So when I got to the restaurant, we were, everybody else had come in and we were meeting and waiting in the bar for our table. And 
I was telling everybody what the CHP had told me. And my sister looked at me and she said, I know you, Candy. I know you well. And you're not going to let this go. And I said, you're right. I'm not. I'm going to start an organization. And my girlfriend, Sam, piped up and said, and you're going to call it MAD, Mothers Against Drunk Driving. No, Drivers, which it was initially, Mothers Against Drunk Drivers. And we all stopped and looked at her and looked at each other. And it was sort of like one of those light bulb moments, you know? And I knew then that that's what I should do. I think the name just clinched it, so. Wow. And and it's been uh, successful under your hands um, and changing an attitude, right? I mean, people, even now I notice the attitude about, well, somebody who um, is high. It's uh, or um, we have a friend. We both have a mutual friend whose daughter was killed by a marijuana impaired driver, and the judge was, oh well, they have a medical card. They had an illness, so there's sympathy. And now with the whole movement that you know addiction is a chronic disease. Well, the the driver who killed your daughter, he had an addiction, and so some people have sympathy for that. But that's not an excuse for killing someone. You're right. And in fact, in his case, it was considered, I believe, a mitigating circumstance, the fact that he was an alcoholic. And and I get into this debate a lot with recovering alcoholics and people in rehab. I have friends that are alcoholics. They drink, but they don't drive. And so when I'm talking about alcoholics who drink and drive, to me, they're criminal abusers of the drug alcohol. And the same is true of prescription meds, marijuana, whatever drugs they do. If they know that they are impactful, and they are, let's face it, says it on the bottle, if you feel different, you drive different, etc., and still make the choice to drive, to me, they're criminal abusers of whatever drug it is they're taking. They can stay home, they can make other choices, but they don't. Yeah. What is the key to your success? I mean, you've changed an attitude uh, uh, about alcohol and driving that, you know, 180 degrees. What was the key to that success? Well, I, there are a number of factors, but I think um, part of it was because we put a face to the statistics. You know, you would hear when Carrie was killed at that time, we were killing, God, 25,000 people a year and alcohol-related crashes. Well, you hear a number and it's like, whoa, that's a lot. But then you see a person and it's like, whoa. And part of the reason I think too, well, I mean, there are a number of reasons, but I had a friend who lived in the cul-de-sac with me. And he said, I remember he came over to me after we learned how Carrie had died. And he said, all I could think of when I heard the story was, it could have been me that killed your child. And I remember thinking, because he did drink and drive, and I had actually been with him when he had done that. And I started thinking about it. I started thinking, what an odd thing to say to someone. Um, boy, does that show how common this problem is. And I, I need to change that attitude so that instead of saying to me, that could have been me that killed your child, I wanted them to say, oh, my God, that could have been my child. That could have been my parent. That could have been my son, my loved one, whatever. And I really worked towards that goal so that people would realize that this is something that could happen to them. And in fact, does happen so many times a day or a year, whatever the numbers were at the time. And also, I'll credit the media. The media was much different then. I never could have started mad now, I think, and been successful. But at that time, there weren't a lot of issues. There weren't a lot of causes. And so... And it took a while for this cause to catch on with the media because so many of them drank and drove. I really had a battle there, you know, to get them to cover this because they were all drunk drivers, I swear, as were half our legislators. But um, the fact that the media really finally did jump on this cause and really do a fabulous job. I mean, every time we'd start a chapter, they'd be over there covering the story. So people would see, gee, not only did it happen to this woman in California, it happened to these people in Texas or West Virginia or Pennsylvania. And from that, I would get calls from other mothers in most cases whose children had died and uh, and they would want to do something. It gave them, it was like, this was the first organization that gave them something positive 
to do in their child's memory. And they would call me and I would anoint them a chapter and, you know, there would be more media coverage over there. And then, of course, this went national in a major way. And the movie came out in 1983, which I really also think had a major impact. And I think people just saw a whole different side. Um, they no longer had sympathy for the drunk driver because they themselves might drink and drive. All of a sudden, they started having sympathy for the survivors and the victims' families. Was there ever, and I think there was, um, a thought back then, um, which we don't have now, that, well, no, I can handle my liquor, right? It's as people who, who can't handle their liquor, right? And so same thing now with marijuana or medications, like, I, I can handle this and, you know, I'm not one of these people. I, I'm, I, I drive better when I'm high. Yeah, I know. All the time. Um, yeah, there were. I mean, I, I was with people who would say, I'd be <laughs> I'm a terrible company if you drink a horrible company. And so I'd be monitoring their drinks and I'd say, well, maybe, okay, you know, we're eating and whatever. And, and you know, I'm fine. I'm, I'm not a real strict, you can't have anything to drink type of person. Um, but I would see somebody and they would be, you know, having a glass of wine or whatever throughout the meal, we'd be talking and, um, and I would, I don't have any problems by the way, and everybody's going to jump up and down, but I've said this before getting in the car with somebody like that. But when they start to go beyond that, I start counting drinks and then I start getting really nervous. And then I will say something and either I will drive or we have to find another way home. But I have had them say, oh no, I've had two drinks before or three drinks before, and I've been able to drive. And I say, fine, you can do that by yourself, but not with me in the car, you know, but I will tell you because I've been around so long, people don't do that with me anymore that's not an issue you know i have more of a problem with that distracted driving. well we change the attitude that's not socially acceptable that's something that you were able to do when i go and i lecture around and i lecture at columbia university at, with the personal leader in uh, leadership institute and these are mba and post mba students and it's interesting because i'll say Okay, no video cameras here, nothing. You know, you can be completely open and honest with me. I'm not going to record your names. I don't even remember them. But how many of you do drink and drive? And I usually don't get any hands. And I'll say, all right, how many of you take drugs and drive? And they'll say legal or illegal. And I'll go both. And boy, about half the hands will go up. And how many of you drive distracted? Well, then everybody's hands go up. Right now, I'm on a big campaign about passenger safety. So I ask them, how many of you ride with somebody? And, and if I say, how many of you ride with somebody who's been drinking and driving? Very few hands go up. Again, because, you know, I, I know I, I've been told I changed the culture of the nation. It's not socially appropriate anymore. It's not right. so it's not acceptable. But if I say, how many of you have ridden with somebody who's drugged? Or how many have you... Have you, have you ever been with somebody who's distracted? You know, most of the class goes up, you know, their hands go up. So to me, it's also empowering passengers to speak up, but changing attitudes again, um, which we I think we still need to do on an ongoing basis. So, um, yeah, I don't see as much of the drinking and driving anymore. Well, I do in crashes that hit the news. But I mean, amongst groups that I lecture to, but I do with drugged and distracted driving, definitely. Yeah, and I think the message has come out to, especially like in high school, also not to uh, drive while drunk, to have a designated driver. But I remember when my daughters were in high school, the DD, the designated driver, was also could be using marijuana. So it's like somehow the message didn't compute. Didn't get through. And no. we've had that through with, with alcohol designated drivers that end up being drunk. Seriously. You know, I've, I've had this come back to me, but I mean, drunk driving still exists. There's no question about it. Killing 10,000 people a year, drunk driving. So, I mean, it's still a major problem that needs to be addressed. Um, but the difference between drunk driving and drugged and distracted driving, which are the areas I focus on, is that drunk driving is no longer socially acceptable, and drugged and distracted driving is. In the case of drunk driving, we didn't really have major opposition when it came to whether or not alcohol impaired. The alcohol industry never came out and said, no, it, you know, you can drive and it doesn't impair you. I don't recall that ever happening. Um, they might say, limit your drink. Well, I don't think they said anything then. Of course, now they do, as you know. But at that time, uh, they didn't oppose us. The only bill they opposed us on was raising the drinking age to 21, and that was it. They didn't oppose us when it 
came to lowering the limit initially when we went to 0.10 per se. They do now when you get much lower than that. Whereas when I tackled drug driving, and I was the first person and group to do that years ago before it became a big known issue, Ed Woods and I, Ed from DUID, Vicky Voices, and I took them on in Colorado and other places as well. Uh, we had opposition, direct open opposition from the cannabis industry. And, you know, here's an industry saying, yeah, it's okay to drive high. We never had that from the alcohol industry. We never had any, I, I just don't remember it, saying, yeah, it's okay to drive drunk. I never heard that ever. But cannabis, oh yeah, we do. I mean, God, the crap that was on their websites was absolute. And I just dealt with this with my oldest granddaughter when I was asking her about her drug use. And she's like, oh, Tayta, the only thing I do is marijuana. And I said, and <laughs> what? You think that's okay? Well, it's not addicting. Ah, oh, <laughs> excuse me, you know, or I, I got this. And I'm like, I thought you were smarter than that. You know, I couldn't believe how, it. how old is she, your granddaughter, having this argument with you? You were going to ask me that, 23 or 24, not sure. But I don't know the ages of any of my grandchildren. And there's a reason <laughs> for that. The reason is I don't want them to grow up. So, and that's the reason. I don't celebrate their birthdays for the same reason. I just don't want them to grow up. So, but I mean, you know, and by the way, I'm sure you know this, or maybe I, you don't, but addiction runs in my family, not on my side, but my son's an addict, recovering addict. My uh, other granddaughter's an addict. And um, this is something I've dealt with with my son from teenagehood on up. I had him in rehab several times. And I've also uh, was a drug counselor number of years ago during the age of Aquarius <laughs> anyway, <laughs> and actually started a program in Okinawa for, for heroin addicted GIs. So, you know, I'm, I'm familiar with, with frankly, all three drug, uh, drunk, drugged and distracted, both from personal experience and from just education. All the D's. And that's something that also that you kind of put together the, the, you tackle all the D's. The three Ds. Yeah, we save lives is the three Ds, and which is why I don't have a car and why I really drive anymore. I'm sort of done. And as you may or may not know, my son was run over when he was four by a drugged, unlicensed driver. She was on Valium, and he was in a coma and permanently brain injured. So, you know, one, how do you, Scott, you have so much things I want to talk to you about. Um, one is the lies when you said that the cannabis center is like it's okay to drive high when you when you're dealing with outright lies and and falsehoods how do you tackle that well you know it's interesting i did a conference once with the heritage was it heritage foundation and there were representatives of the cannabis industry there and so i sat down with them and i said yeah i would love to meet with you later and see if we couldn't find some common ground here which is what i did with the alcohol industry when i was at mad i firmly believe in working with those um and i don't consider them your enemies i really don't but those who may oppose you or may be part of the problem to see if I can help them become part of the solution. Anyway, they they weren't real interested in meeting with me afterwards. And when I spoke at the cannabis conference in New York some years ago, they never invited me back. And I heard it was, they realized it was a mistake to invite me in the first place. How funny is that? But um, the first thing I think, this is my approach. I would try and eat with them, seriously. I would try and sit down with them and just say, hey, look, um, you know, is there some way that we can find some common ground here because people are dying? It is an issue. And um, and look, there's a common sense element here. Do you know Ed Woods? It, it, yeah, Ed Woods. He, he has been on this podcast, one of the first yeah. podcasts with Ed Woods of um, DUID, uh, victim voices. DUID Victim Voices. Love him. And he's our legislative um, director. And so, but Ed's very science in his approach. He does charts and graphs and statistics, and he does them well. He goes in whenever, what's his name out of Australia, Mike, what's his name, sends out the stuff on how safe it is to drive with cannabis. You know, Ed counters every point, and God, I'm so glad I, I know him. And I, that's not my approach, by the way, but that's his, and it works very well. So I think that, you know, if you can sit down with them and oh, but the one thing that I see forgotten in all of this is that I, I say to him, why do you do that? I, you know, I think it's great that you do, but the, the, there's something called common sense, Ed. You know, we don't we don't 
say that enough. We don't go look. If you, I love um, Heidi King. I met with her. She was so gung ho on this cause. I was so sorry to see her go. Um, boy, she just took this on with a vengeance. And I love that if you feel different, you drive different. I mean, this is just common sense. But wait a second. I don't know if you feel different, you drive different. Because um, I find, and I, I work in the emergency department, right? And I have people who are, I mean, everything. They're 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 high. They're clear. Anyone else around them can see that they're tweaking on meth, and they they don't just feel different. They look different to everyone else, but internally, they don't have that understanding on themselves. Oh, having been a drug counselor. I'm, I'm going to tell you that there isn't a single addict or person I know that doesn't take drugs to feel different. That's right, but they, they, but when they're impaired and they're clearly impaired to everyone around them, they don't feel it. They don't realize that. No, that's why they take them. Yes, they do. I disagree with you. They do. That's why they take them. If they stayed the same, had no difference in their feelings or anything else, they wouldn't take drugs. My son's an addict. Believe me, I have been through this. They take drugs to feel different, to change how they feel, to change how they look at what's going on around them. Otherwise, why bother? Right. But they may say they feel better. So then they drive better. That they're feeling is it better, worse. I don't care. They're feeling different. Mm, they're so. not the same as being completely sober and completely focused. It's not the same. I mean, look... <laughs> When I was counseling heroin addicted GIs, my ex-husband was a backseater on an RF4. And these were guys that just come out of Vietnam because we this was over in Okinawa during the war. And I remember one time when my ex came home and he said, honey, you know, you've got to quit counseling these, these guys. And I said, why? He said, because when they're not on drugs, they don't do as good a job as when they are. Look, they there is a change in what they do. There is a change in their actions, a change in their personality. It's true of prescription meds. Of course. You know, Any, you anything. Absolutely. So, you know, you just will never convince me that they don't know they're feeling different. That's why they took the drug. They may not admit it, but even if they say, well, I feel much better, that's feeling different. So, so. anyway, my soapbox. Yeah, your soapbox, but. I don't know if we should keep arguing here, but I don't know if that's the right message as far as like, you know, don't drink and drive. That's a clear message, right? And, and it's not working anymore, by the way. So I'm having issues with the don't drink and drive, don't yeah. do drugs, yeah. don't drive, distracted. We've been doing that for years. People are tired of hearing it. My focus, as you know, right now, or as I mentioned earlier, is on passenger safety. So I am a firm believer that if passengers have the courage to intervene when somebody's going to drive drunk, drugged, or distracted, that will make all the difference and can make all the difference in the world. In fact, I firmly believe, if you look at the statistics from 2019, 69% of the deaths on our highways were passengers, passengers. And all of those passengers, I would say most of them, because obviously some were too young, could have spoken out and should have spoken out. Mm -hmm. And have they spoken out, they may not have been dead or the driver may have not driven or whatever. I mean, these are choices people make. So my focus right now is on not saying to somebody, don't drive drugged, because everybody says don't drive drugged, and they don't listen. It's on trying to deal with them either as a passenger or the passengers in their cars and trying to point out, look, you know, do you see a difference in their driving? And I will tell you, when I asked this question, which I just did at George Mason, they do know they're drugged. They do know the, pass uh, the drivers. They can tell by the way they're driving. Uh -huh. So what do you, how do you teach to, to intervene? Say, pull over? Or... Well, no, we have, in fact, on our website, we save lives website, on our passenger safety website, some adorable teams out of Florida uh, that work with some of the programs we partner with put together a series of videos on techniques that you can use and say when you're in this position. One of them, which I thought was quite clever, uh, I will usually say, um, to when I'm speaking about passenger safety, I will usually say, try and determine when it comes to impairment, try and determine ahead of time before you get in the car, if they are impaired. And usually they know that because they're with them. They're with them drinking, they're with them drugging, you know, and, and then try and stop it before they get in the car. 
But just say you didn't observe this or they came to pick you up and you get in the car and you notice that they are drugged. This video that we have, I really thought was clever. The gal said, because the driver started driving and the gal said to her, you know, are you under the, have you been drinking or have you, oh, she had been smoking marijuana. Oh, you know, I just had a little, it makes me feel better, makes me drive better. And I think in this case, the gal said, hey, I really got to go to the bathroom. Can you pull over at the first gas station? Which she did. And the passenger got out of the car, called her mother or her friend and said, I'm with so-and-so, she's high. She's not safe to drive. And, you know, what should I do? And I think the person said, see if you can get her, keep her from driving or I'll pick you up. I don't remember the whole, because there's about eight videos. So, but there's a number of things you can do. Ask the person to come pick you up, try and take the keys, not forcefully, um, because you could get hurt, but try and take the keys, try and convince them to go with you in a safe ride home. Um, so there are a number of intervention techniques that you can use. And, and, and I do role playing with people when I get into a group and I love doing this because I'm so passionate about it, but I'll say, okay, Mary, you're in the car with John, you know, and John is getting on his cell phone, you know, and what do you do, Mary? Are you concerned? Are you, you know, how do you handle that? And what's interesting to me is just from anecdotal, the number one reason why passengers don't say anything is they don't want to alienate their friend. You know, it's kind of, a, and I'm like, you don't think your life is worth it? And you think that person is a real friend that would, that would um, endanger your life? You know, people don't have a high enough opinion of themselves these days. I swear to God, you know, I, it's like, do you, not care enough about yourself don't you want to live well i want you to live i really do get on soapboxes but um but i'm just saying that there are just a number of things you can do and you can learn how to do them yeah what there's a, a movement with um with uh drunk driving and drug driving to have a vision zero no more is that possible is that even realistic no. to say no well, zero yeah, isn't that interesting to bring that up? I belong, but I don't I don't go to their meetings and stuff because it's an impossible goal. Right. So, I just think so too. It's like, wait, that's you're setting yourself up for failure. Exactly. And the thing of it is, I mean, when I started that, our thing was like, I think we said 10% reduction. Actually, we had a 20% reduction. Um, I thought we set very realistic goals, not having a clue, you know, what we were capable of doing. And in my in the master classes that I'm developing, um, I have a you know how to develop a strategic plan. And one of the things that I emphasize is setting realistic goals. And one of the examples I use is Vision Zero and how unrealistic that goal is, and why I don't get excited about joining. You know? Right? Yeah, because you can't. You can't get to zero about anything, right? There's always okay. exception. Um, tell us about your master classes. What is that? Well, for the Mentor Institute, I mentioned that I guest lecture at Columbia, and Professor Hatandra Wadra is the professor that I've worked with there, and he now has what's called the Mentor Institute and the Mentor Foundation, which, by the way, um, is opening up youth fellowships for young change makers, where they can go through a course and learn how to be a change maker. And uh, anyway, so I had put together a I was going to do this on my own, a master class because I get so I, I get so frustrated when I see these movements, by the way, including the anti-drug movement or the anti-drug drug, well, there is no anti-drug driving movement per se, but I get contacted by a lot of people in, in the uh, anti-drug movement, and I get frustrated with them too, but um, and I do. Anyway, and I see a lot of this, not just in these movements, but other movements as well. I hear from people with all kinds of issues, um, inadequate medical care, you know, foster children issues. I could go on the list. And I and me too. And I, I don't see any major results from these movements. And so, and I keep thinking, God, I wish I had all the money in the world and I could work with them and show them how to do this and help them. So anyway, I thought, well, why not do it? So I was starting to put a masterclass together for me to do. And I happened to mention it to Hachandra and I showed him the outline and he got all excited. <laughs> he said, I want to do this. He said, I want you to do this. So it's two courses. One is on activism, how to be a successful activist. 
and uh, what the traits are and characteristics of leadership and, you know, what you need uh, to be an activist. It's not to be a leader, it's to be an activist leader. And there's a difference. And, and there's a difference between being an activist and an advocate. And the other is on how to, how to make your movement move. <laughs> so, so many don't, you know, how to, how, to, how to create a successful movement that actually goes somewhere. Wow, so, that's great. Any key key points for making things move? No, but I, probably in my course. But let me let me get on another soapbox here for a second. I can't stand the term, and I hear it all the time from advocates when I say, and they call me up for advice, and I go, "What is it that you want to do? Tell me what you want to do." I want to make people aware that there's a drug problem. <laughs> people are aware they're already aware, they're already aware. <laughs> and what does that mean and when i say and what does that mean well they need to know trust and i and i finally after listening to this for about two minutes i'm older i have no patience i'm like but they know this you really think they don't know this the emphasis, and when I lectured at George Mason the other day, the professor and I got into a big discussion about this, and she, she said she thinks that's why their classes don't, I don't know if they're listening, but why they have issues with their students in these, they go to these classes and they learn about the problem, but what they're not learning is how to solve the right. problem. We want to do something. We don't want exactly. to just talk about something. I never said, I want to make people aware of the drunk. I never said that. No, you want to save lives. I said, I want to solve the problem. Every task force that I got, every presidential commission said solve, not study, but solve, because we'd studied this stuff to death. Ed and I get on this kick about drugs too. We've studied it to death. We don't need enough. To study. We don't need more research. We exactly. got enough to act now. Exactly. I right. agree. We need, yeah, we need action and we need solutions. And then what we need to do is make people aware of what they can do to become part of the solution versus part of the problem. So, Right, empowering. Ah, I love it. I love it. You're so brilliant. Um, you um, you Gee, talk about you several involved. words that matter. We kind of talk about that. And you, you, you correct people, including me, uh, mm -hmm. when we use the wrong word, such right. as accident instead mm -hmm. of crash or... Mm -hmm. Or you said you didn't lose your daughter; uh, she was killed. Can you explain why those words are so important? Well, if you ever go and sit in on a court proceeding uh, in a drunk driving case, specifically, you'll hear the defense attorney say this quite often: "Oh, jury, oh, judge, it was only an accident. It was only an accident, and it wasn't." And so, to me, accident. I mean, there's technical definitions for this too, but to me, accident dismisses, well, first it doesn't hold the driver accountable because this is a choice. The drive, Drivers make choices to drive drunk, drugged, and distracted. They make choices. So this is a choice that they made. There's nothing accidental about this choice, nothing whatsoever. Um, it excuses their behavior, it denies culpability. It dismisses, in a way, it dismisses my daughter's life you know, to say that she was killed in an accident. And drunk and drug driving are crimes. They are legitimate by the FBI definition crimes. I, in fact, I will say, and I prefer crime over crash, if I know specifically we're dealing with drunk and drug driving. The media, whom I've dealt with on this issue, prefers, well, they we're still de dealing with them on changing the term accident, but they're, they're feedback to me is, well, until they've been convicted, then I said, then say alleged crime of drunk driving, you know? But if you can't do that, at least say crash collision or wreck. I have a bill right now in California that we're sponsoring that will replace the word accident in all drunk, drugged, and distracted driving legislation with the word crash, collision, or wreck. I'm really excited about this bill. I'd like to take it. Yeah, I'd like to take it across the country. So um, crash is what it is. Collision or wreck is what it is. And in the case of drunk and drugged, it's crime. Um, as far as the word lose, <laughs> the movie that they did about me, and this is true, when uh, when I was came home, my daughter had been killed and I didn't know it, and my ex-husband and my father were sitting on the lawn. 
waiting for me to come home. This is long before the days of cell phones. And when I got out of the car, they both came running over and uh, my ex-husband, Steve, held on to me and he said, honey, we've lost Carrie. <laughs> I said, well, we'll find her. I said, well, just call the neighbors. You know, did you call so-and-so? Let me, and I started to walk over. And he said, no, no, you don't understand. She was killed. Lost isn't accurate here. It's, she wasn't lost. Someone made a choice and they killed her. She's dead because of someone's choice. She was killed by a drunk driver. Lost to me is misleading. It really is. It's like they're floating around, although I do believe in an afterlife, but it's like they're floating around somewhere and just waiting for us to grab them. You know, um, sorry, you lost your child. Lost? This is the most devastating thing that happened to me in my life. And I've had many losses. This doesn't even compare. So, no, I didn't lose my child. She was killed. You know, she's dead because someone killed her. So, um, and, and as I mentioned to you before, when I posted this on Facebook, the reaction that I got was the same. You know, nobody agreed with the word loss in these cases. So everybody felt that it was really inadequate. Um, so... We have, a, 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 I've got distracted because I'm so into <laughs> talking to your conversations, but um, Pula Velasquez it works at a very busy trauma center. She uh, takes care of patients who have been victims of crashes uh, from alcohol, uh, lots of uh, marijuana impaired drivers. And she takes that those instances and turns it into injury prevention. And her questions um, to you is why... Um, why do people who are clearly impaired on marijuana are not getting the same attention and focus as alcohol-related injury? And what's your advice um, to her where she could do things um, differently and make an impact in her community? Okay, so let me make sure I understand the question. She's saying that those who are injured or killed in drug driving crashes... Not, not killed or injured. She works at a trauma center, so patient people come in as patients, so they're injured. From uh, and they are victims of marijuana impaired drivers. Okay, and they're, so and you're right. So if the if the police if there's a drunk driver, you know we always see right. police in the trauma right. center and they're there mm -hmm. writing notes and you know doing whatever uh, law enforcement does. But we have the same you know a, a scenario with someone high on, on marijuana. Police aren't there. They're not taking notes. Nobody cares. Okay, I'm still a little confused. So she, she the patient that comes in, the person that comes in was injured in a drug driving crash or they were the drug driver and injured themselves or in both both oh either or both and right. so whoever shows up injured right okay, in the trauma unit okay and if they were injured or a drunk driver the police would be there and in the case of drugs the police aren't there no and, and where is this happening probably all over the united states but this is san diego okay well <sighs> Huh, interesting, because San Diego actually did a pilot project on oral fluid testing. Um, I, in the first place, this is what happens, and it's unfortunate. And in fact, I'm getting ready to leave um, next week or the week after and speak to what are called drug recognition experts. And uh, in Oregon, they're having a conference, and I'm going to be speaking there. And, and I'm going to bring this to their attention. And so email me something about this later, including her contact info. But what normally happens, unfortunately, so someone's in, involved in a crash and the driver is under the influence of both alcohol and drugs, which is the most common right now. So what the cops do, unfortunately, is they test for alcohol. Once they sense alcohol, they forget drugs. So we don't have an accurate accounting of how many people are injured, killed, or whatever in drug driving crashes. And that's one of the main reasons why. The second thing is... Um, if they can't get a test there, they usually try and get a test at the hospital. If they sense no alcohol in the driver, they will then test for drugs. But testing for drugs is a lot different than testing for alcohol, which is why we promote support oral fluid testing. And so I'm assuming they would go to the hospital and they would test them there. And I don't know why they wouldn't. And I don't know why she should get, do you know what? She should reach out. I should connect her with the local drug recognition experts in that area and have her work with them and talk to them. 
because they're the ones that really do the good testing of the drivers that are far more in detail. But see, the thing is, they'll say that because they're um, patients now, they can't do their, their little test, right? So once you become a patient, they can't do their testing and keep you at the scene because they're injured. The priority is medical. Right. And also we have HIPAA, we have HIPAA uh, laws, so we can't, we won't call law enforcement and say, hey, this person was impaired. They need to be able to follow up and, and, and um, right. And, and even if there's like clear, you know, I've had patients in the trauma unit, you're getting high from them because they smell, right. <laughs> you could tell that they've, they're uh, um, under the influence. They even say, yeah, I was, you know, I was, were, you, were you using any drugs? Oh, no, just, just weed. No, you're saying you can't call the police to come in and take them off the road or come and give them a ticket or whatever. No, it that's is. a that's a HIPAA violation. No. So we but we you we really count on law enforcement to do that. But you can do it if they're drunk. Because you said, why is there a police presence when they're drunk, but not when they're drugged? Yeah. So so police has a sense. They're very well trained. All of law enforcement is very well trained about potential alcohol. But mm -hmm. not all of law enforcement, except for the exception of the DRE officers, okay. are as uh, a, astute um, yeah. at, at knowing or recognizing or following through. And it's probably because the laws are laxed, right? The laws are very clear on how to prosecute. Um, I'm not an expert. This is what I imagine that they're gonna. The law enforcement has limited resources, so they're gonna go after the things that that they can clearly. Um, make a difference, yes. in, right? So they could clearly make a difference with alcohol. With right. drugs, they can't. It's 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 a pain, and then they could lose, and they just wasted their time, and um, and it, it it it's harder to get results or solutions from that, so they let it go. Well, that's true. I mean, we have we did a white paper to Congress, and we talk about that actually on our website about how there's no prosecution, and we list the reasons why there's no prosecution. There's no, and it's true. District attorneys only like to prosecute in cases they think they can win, and drugs is a much tougher case to win at this point in time, mainly because of the lack of testing. Um, although Ed and I were talking about this the other day, we don't support setting a limit on THC. Um, to me, it should be zero limit. And uh, if you do a 0.5, most of the drug drivers are below 0.5. So you haven't accomplished a single thing. But um, from what we learned and what we're hearing, we get more convictions when there is no limit than you do when there is a limit. Again, I think it's a matter of continuing. Well, you know what? The other thing is, it's a matter of continuing to put pressure on them to do this. There's nobody doing that. You know, I mean, we had the same issues with alcohol in the beginning. We had to go and, you know, be activists and put pressure and, you know, call DAs and call the police and do all this kind of stuff. I think that that's a good thing is maybe what she could do is after the case with no HIPAA is just say, hey, just so you know, we had five cases like this and nobody came from law enforcement. I think she should reach out and meet with, if I lived in her area, I'd work with her on this, but I don't with the local law enforcement and the DREs, I think she should speak at a conference and talk about this and get some, you know, participation here and some partnership going with people who can make a difference, with people who can help her um, change this issue that's happening there. I'll learn more about this when I'm at the DRE conference in Oregon. So like I said, send me her stuff and I'll see if there can't be some follow-up done. But she and anyone else who feels the same way she does in San Diego um, should actually do something, yeah. you know, take some action. Yeah. Uh, and I I'm think that the trauma centers are really the eyes and ears of this problem. And because they see, they, I mean, the medical examiner, they see fatalities, but they're for every one fatality, right? There's probably, I don't know, 10 other people who are injured who, are, who don't get into that statistic. Yeah, they should actually, you know, when I first started MAD, we couldn't get the support of the medical profession. It took us years before we could get the med. Yeah, isn't it? Um, but I think that that's a good point. I think that trauma people, I'll come, I'll go talk to, you know, I'll come and talk and do whatever, help. Um, but they should get something going. They should take some action. We should outline a course of action for them to take in conjunction with the law enforcement, with DAs and prosecutors and police and anyone else that can be involved in. I'm working now with a victim whose son was killed by a marijuana impaired driver in Los Angeles. And Lori is looking for some things to do, and she's going to be speaking on our behalf and 
stuff. And I bet she'd love to. Um, her son was her, to, you know, her the light of her life, and she's having kind of a tough time. Um, and well, wait, she, here's another connection. We have a bill in California, SB 1097. I, 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 you may, I don't know, it'd be interesting to get your opinion on this. Uh, because we just talked about how you want to make solutions, right? I don't know how compl- – I think it, it's changing culture, but it's to put uh, warning labels on marijuana products, including Absolutely. drug drivers. We, we, we have actually promoted that in the past through social media. Oh, okay. Okay, good. <laughs> I was afraid we, that it's – We think they should put warning <laughs> labels on cell phones, you know. Right. Um, but yeah, no, no, absolutely agree. So we, we, so we have that. And then uh, – so connect – did you say her name is Lori? Well, Lori is living actually in Washington state, but her son was killed in California. So we save lives. In fact, she's going to carry one or she's going to see about getting one of our bills carried in Washington state. But absolutely. I'll, you know, we can put this. Yeah, because she could help um, pass this bill. It it passed Senate uh, Business and Professionals Committee by eight vote. And you need eight votes to pass. And and so it barely sweep, sweeped by. And we can use her her son's story. Well, you can, and you should have approached us in the beginning because we put coalitions together of California groups who support these things. Um, we've got two going right now on two bills in California, not having to deal with this issue. But this is something we would definitely support. Absolutely. I didn't even know. So okay, so we got we got work to do. I'm gonna uh, hopefully you'll help us support SB 1097. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no. Would, yeah. would be happy to, and I agree with you. Who's opposing it? Is it a political but, but, issue? Yeah, all the, all, the, all the marijuana industry, all weed maps, no, cannabis no, but, coalition. Yeah, got that. Democrat versus Republican. Is it? Are the Democrats supporting it or opposing no, it? I don't know. I can't tell if it's a political divide. Uh, my suspicion is, and I haven't proved it, is that it's whoever's bought by the industry. Republican or Democrats, whoever uh, gets really money from that. Yeah, it's not a party politic. Yeah. Um, and, and I need to know more about that. But I am sure Josh's story is actually on our website. Okay. And um, so I can send it to you. You can get it by going to our website. That's Lori's son. And I am going to see her. She's coming down to the Oregon conference um, to hear me speak. And uh, so, and I can certainly pass on information to her before then, but I'm sure she would love to do this. That's she great. Looking That's great. For very proactive, positive things to do in her son's memory. So. Yeah. All right. So that would be, that would be great. Um, uh, we need, we need that voice. Uh, and uh, I think Pula will be very excited to hear this podcast. Of course, I will tell her about it before it airs. So um, as she can have some, some action. Um, the other bill not related to drug driving, but I just want to let you know about that that I'm proud of is in California, SB 864, is to include fentanyl in drug tests, which we don't do right now in most of the country. So I did a, a pilot project of this in San Diego, and so most hospitals in San Diego are doing that. And we want every hospital in America, but we're starting with California, that if you're going to do a drug test for whatever in a hospital setting, that it should include fentanyl, especially since that's the number one killer. Um, So hopefully that meets your uh, making things move philosophy. Um, Are you familiar with Mothers Against Drug Deaths? No. They're based in San Francisco, MADD. Yeah. I'm waiting to see if they're going to have an issue with their name. So they're not contactable, but they put up a big um, billboard. You didn't see the news on this in San Francisco? That says San Francisco is known for its Oh, I think I saw that. Yeah, very sad. And it's, and and it's needles. And no, and it's fentanyl deaths. Yeah. Yeah, and it's fentanyl deaths. God, um, have you talked to Drager or Allaire? Oh, Allaire isn't Allaire anymore. I think they're Abbott. You know, they do drug testing. They do oral fluid testing. And I think fentanyl is included in their tests, I believe. Yeah, but that's that's, you, for the, that's for driving. But um, in a hospital setting, it takes have, only... No, they do that too. They do workplace environment and all that kind of stuff. Right. But in a hospital um, setting, and I, I did... Um, research what's capable. It's, it takes seventy five cents to buy a reagent that you include, and it and then it would be included in whatever drug tests that you do. Our 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 call to action is that if you're going to test for PCP and cocaine and opiates, then it should include fentanyl. 
Right. Well, it should include them all. Right. And so most people who hear this say, it's not already done. And it's like, no, mm-hmm. it's not. Yeah. <laughs> the medical community needs to step up a bit. They do. But I thought that years ago. Um, but they do. They need to take more action. They need to be more proactive. And um, yeah, they they need to know they can make a difference. They can have an impact and then they need to do it. Right. Yeah. Um, technologies. What about some technologies that make um, driving safer? Like, you know, you turn on the ignition, if there's any alcohol or marijuana uh, smell, then you can't turn on the car or uh, self-driving cars. Or what do you think of that as solutions? Okay, I don't. But um, in the first place, to my knowledge, there is no technology yet to determine if you're driving under the influence of marijuana. If there is, I'm not familiar with it. Usually I'm not familiar either. But I, I mean, yeah, but as, a, as a non-technology, I could like, you know, we can. The right. Order is no. there, yeah. But they usually contact me immediately. You know, hi, we're putting this thing together, blah, blah, blah. There is for alcohol. I think IIDs are the greatest thing since sliced bread. I love the dad's program, which is very similar. And it's when you turn on the ignition. And I think they all have a role to play, but I don't think they're the only solution. I don't think they're the ultimate solution. And most of these things won't happen for years and years and years. So I still believe in a multi-level approach that you still need to educate people about the solutions and the choices they can make and how to make better and safer choices. You still need driver's license suspensions, I believe, in taking away the car when the when the um, situation is egregious enough. I mean, we still need to hold people accountable for their actions. The biggest deterrent to all of these drunk, drugged, and distracted driving is swift and sure punishment. We don't do that anymore. It's years before any case goes to court. Years. Two years, and they're still driving around, whether it's on drugs or alcohol. They usually still have a license. They got it back somehow or whatever, and there's just no accountability. We are not holding people accountable. I I love how you're just very direct and unapologetic that things are a crime and that crime should be punished. Absolutely. But, But yet a lot of our society isn't quite there and muddies the water, right? So there's a whole movement to normalize drug use, and then there's even a movement to eliminate stigma. And that sounds good. Like, oh, I want to eliminate stigma. Um, and But that's a slippery slope. We want to eliminate stigma on somebody who has a problem. If you're an alcoholic and you need treatment, if you have addiction and you need treatment, then you shouldn't have stigma about getting that treatment. But there should be stigma about using. That's not healthy. Don't smoke. That's bad for you, right? That We, limit, we, we have stigma on smoking. We should have the same stigma about, you know, um, smoking pot, which is the same thing as smoking cigarettes. I mean, it's just as dangerous. Setting aside the drug part about it, it's yeah. still called cancer. But and but that whole that what do you think about the whole stigma movement and eliminating stigma and having it get muddied up with the 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 prevention message? Well, in the first place, I have to tell you, I do support decriminalizing marijuana. I do. I don't. I don't personally support legalizing marijuana, but We Save Lives does not take a position on the issue. Our position is against drug driving, and that's where we focus. Um, as far as stigma goes, and I'll pay a lot of attention to all this stuff because it's all trendy and it'll go away in a year or two, is that you know there shouldn't be a stigma against mental health issues, et cetera. And again, I'm going to go back to the criminal abuse. But, but you were uh, able to create stigma for driving under the influence. I never thought of it as stigma. I never it's not. It's not socially acceptable today. Yeah, it's not socially acceptable. Right, and I do think that drug driving and distracted driving should be socially unacceptable, and that's right. one of the things that we work towards is making them socially unacceptable. And I will go back to what I said before. You know, and I've said this with alcohol. If you have an alcohol problem, it's your problem. You get behind the wheel of a car, it's my problem. If you have a drug problem, it's your problem. You get behind the wheel of a car, and it becomes my problem. Because I don't take a position or issues on just using drugs in general. That's not where I come from and that's not where my organization comes from. I don't deal with that aspect of it. And because I've got a drug addicted son. But what, what about youth? Don't you, don't you deal with uh, underage drinking? I don't. No, uh-huh. we save lives. Uh-huh. 
do that. No, I passed 21. That was my thing. It worked successful. Thousands of lives have been saved. Other organizations deal with underage drinking, but we save lives doesn't focus on that at all. But do I, would I talk against using drugs? Yeah, with my kids I, or grandkids, I do. You know, do I think they shouldn't do it? Absolutely. And I give them a bad time if I know they're doing it. Do I think they should go into rehab? Absolutely. I think they should. But again, when it comes to what I consider the criminal misuse of a drug, where you're getting behind the wheel of a car, you go out target shooting with somebody while you're high, you know, with a gun, then to me, that's the criminal abuse of whatever drug it is they're taking. So, and that's think, kind of how I differentiate. I, and I, I, I like that. And then you, you draw a line. That's a line. And that it, it makes sense. So it's not, it's not like everything's okay. Right. God, no. Uh-uh. Yeah. Yeah. And I, that's amazing. You, <laughs> you put things so clearly. Um, gold standard solutions. If you had a magic wand, um, then you could pass any law uh, that you, you've already done so much for our country and to save lives. But if you could, at this point in time where we are right now, what still needs to happen? In regards to what? I mean, I'd like the word to end. <laughs> yeah, there we go. How about let's stick to alcohol because that's. I'm an activist for. Or, the, or, or if you want the three D's, the three D's. Yeah. Well, let me give you an example. This is distracted driving. Um, so someone did a TV show in Minnesota, one of our groups that we work with. So excited about the show and should be because it was a long show, but the gal the moderator said oh we're doing so uh, oh boy we're doing so much in minnesota about distracted driving we've got high fines this and that whatever and my friend said oh yes but no and so i went back and i said well let's to him later i said you're so not an activist and he isn't and i said if you look at the fines in minnesota for littering they're four hundred dollars if you look at the fine for distracted driving, it's 120. I said, now <laughs> tell me how many people are killed by littering? So if I ruled the world on all three issues, on drunk driving, I firmly believe in enforcing the laws we already have, which isn't happening. I firmly believe in swift and sure punishment, which isn't happening. And I firmly believe in a multi-level approach, which isn't happening mainly because of special interest groups who think their approach is better than another approach and go in and try and get only their approach. So I wish everybody would work together and just try to get the damn driver off the road by doing a number of things that we were able to do 40 years ago and we succeeded. If it comes to drugged driving, I firmly believe that we need to be just as tough on drug drivers as we are on those who drive under the influence of alcohol. It's equally as dangerous, if not more so. And the reason I say if not more so, it's not because it may be more apparent. It's because with alcohol and drunk driving, it usually occurs between certain hours, like 10 at night to the next morning. With drug driving, especially with prescription drugs, it's all day. It's a 24 hour a day thing. So you're in danger 24 hours a day from a potential drug driver. So we're talking about laws now. So in terms of laws, I really believe we need to be as tough with drug driving. We need to test every driver that's involved in a crash, not just for alcohol, but for drugs, or every driver that gets stopped, not just for alcohol. And I say this to cops, for alcohol, but for drugs, and we need to then treat them accordingly, whatever the, you know, make sure that their car is taken away, their license is taken away, whatever, um, whatever the sanctions are. And they should be tough, in my opinion, but I believe in holding people accountable. As for distracted driving, it needs to be made a crime in every single state. It should be a primary offense. The fines should be so high that people really take a second look at it. Bluetooth are not safe. It's like driving with a 0.08 BAC. And I'm so sick of hearing people say, well, I drive with my Bluetooth. Aren't I safe? No, you're not. And if I say to them, well, would you drive under the influence of alcohol? Oh my God, never. Well, that's what you're doing when you're driving with the Bluetooth. You're driving as if you're driving under a 0.08. So I would like to make Bluetooth just as unsafe from a legal perspective as texting is. You know, oh, don't text and drive. There's all these fines and punishment for texting. Well, guess what, guys? Any use of a cell phone or a Bluetooth is dangerous. Any, any 
any device like that is dangerous. So to me, they all should be treated equally. And that's what I'd like to do in terms of laws. Yeah. Wow. I think that that is great. And with that, uh, I think it's a good ending. I want to say thank you to Pua, who is our injury prevention specialist at a trauma unit, We're trying to make a difference, and now has armed um, with uh, she's not great ideas. Arm. Yes. <laughs> well, yes. armor with the more. Yeah. <laughs> and thank you so much for your very clear voice uh, message um uh candace leitner you're really an inspiration um a legend and still at it may you have a, a lot of health um uh, and, and continued energy uh to continue uh your activism well thank you so much and thank you again for having me on the show oh, i enjoyed it Thank you for listening to High Truths on Drugs and Addiction, where national experts bring you facts and answer your questions. This week's episode would not be possible without the generous support from our sponsor. A sincere and warm thank you to Isaac, the International Academy on the Science and Impact of Cannabis, doctors educating on the harms of marijuana. Visit IsaacOne.org, I-A-S-I-C one.org to view their medical library translated for public understanding, Listen to their speaker series and follow the science. Our producer is Dave Rivas from Davey Boy Productions. I am your host, Dr. Oni Lev. We hope we brought your day a little bit more high truths. Mm-hmm.